20,000 feet. Recover now. Ten thousand feet. If not recovered, eject. Eject. Since man first took to the air, one single maneuver has killed more pilots and destroyed their aircraft than all others put together, spinning. All aircraft can be made to spin, but not all aircraft can be made to recover. This one is spinning intentionally. The pilot applies the correct technique and it safely recovers. A Jaguar being tested, the engine cuts or flames out and the aircraft spins in clouds of unburnt fuel. Why do we need to carry out spin testing? First of all, it's a useless flight mode. Secondly, it's been of no tactical value since the First World War. And thirdly, many of our frontline aircraft operate at levels below which they could safely recover from a spin. I think it's quite clear then that it's important that we must establish that when an aircraft will depart from controlled flight so that frontline air crews can fly with confidence to the limit of the flight envelope. In the event that the aircraft then does depart from controlled flight, we, the test pilot, must have established ways by which that aircraft can regain controlled flight again. Remember that spinning can be confusing, disorientating, and an uncomfortable mode, especially if you didn't expect to be in a spin to start with. Now, I'm going to show you some film clips from various spinning trials. What I'd like you to bear in mind during this film is one factor. And if you go away from this lecture with one factor alone, we will have achieved something. And that is that whenever you're spinning, be prepared for the unexpected. An American Buckeye trainer. The spin was intended to be four turns. If you count closely, you'll see that uh, recovery didn't occur until 33 turns later. And the reason for this delayed recovery was never found. As the pilot tried to recover, the Buckeye reversed the direction of its spin from which recovery was possible. This next clip is of an F4J. It entered a flat spin after the first two turns. Notice the ineffectiveness as the spin parachute as it gets caught up in the wake turbulence from the aircraft. There's a good learning point here, always ensure that spin chutes are on long enough cables and fired well away from the aircraft such that they can be effective. The ineffective anti-spin chute intended to stabilize the aircraft is jettisoned. The F4 spins on to destruction. Is all spinning dangerous? We tend to shy away from uh, words like dangerous because we don't embark on anything unless it's truly thought out, but there is always that area of uncertainty. And in spinning, there is perhaps the highest uh, proportion of uncertainty. So we'd like to call it high risk rather than dangerous. But in general, once the aircraft enters the spin, uh, it's a very disorientating motion. And pilots are not normally used to it, uh, which is another reason we train here that the more often you see the spin, the more likely you are to be able to recognize the problems and recover. A jet provost is based at Boscombe Down for spin training. Surprisingly, few service pilots have recent spinning experience. No, actually, I spun only once in my life so far, and this was during pilot training, several, you know, about 10 years ago. Yep, I think we're ready to go. Let's just check to see if there's any unserviceability uh, on the airplane. Vic Lockwood signs the traditional RAF Form 700. The aircraft is now his responsibility. Please don't break it. Well, you're going to pay for it. Okay, yeah, let's go. Okay, this is your first trip, Harry, in the JP. And we're going to uh, have a look at all sorts of things in the spin as well. Okay. So, rather than confuse you with too much of the, the technical detail. I'll look after most of the limits and I'll remind you of all the different flying limits right. as we go so that we can actually concentrate on the spinning. The Jet Provost is not a pleasant aircraft to spin and 12 of them have been lost in RAF spinning accidents. Okay, if we just put our helmets on here now. We're 
it's running a little bit behind, so what I suggest is you get in and check the seat. You're used to the seat. We've been over this, that before. Yeah. So you check it and climb in and get strapped. I'll walk around and make sure all the airplanes there, and I'll see you back in the cockpit. All right. All pilots have to be familiar with the ejector seat, which is fitted to the aircraft they are about to fly. Harry Fail, the German student, straps in. He must remove the safety pins to arm the explosive ejector seats. If a single pin is left in, that seat will not eject. So the pins are placed in a rack which both pilots can see and check. The jet provost first flew as long ago as 1954. It has manual controls which need considerable physical strength to recover from a spin. After takeoff, Harry climbs to 16,000 feet. Nothing to lose. This is good. Okay, right, right about here. Oh, Jesus Christ. The rotation rate increases. And it's oscillatory. It's very difficult to hold the stick Okay, I'll push it right away. It comes opposite. Oh, that's very difficult. Okay, I'll push it right away. Okay, I'll push it right away. Okay, I'll push it right away. It's very difficult to recover the aircraft like this. I mean, there must be a real muscle mass. Center and putting out. Okay. Okay, we've got to go to the engine. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Quite wild. <laughs> the next aircraft in the spinning syllabus is the Hawk Advanced Trainer, a much more modern design, but one with some unpleasant spinning characteristics, which are somewhat worrying the New Zealand student, Steve Moore. Is there any ch uh, danger of the actual uh, spin becoming inverted, or the aircraft becoming inverted? Well, the, the spin does get agitated, and mm -hmm. I suppose of all the spins that we do, there is, that is the one that yeah. uh, there is a chance of it going inverted. I don't know of one uh, Hawk going inverted. However, uh, if the aircraft does enter an inverted spin, I'd like you to take the normal uh, mm -hmm. control positions for recovery. Yeah. However, there is a warning in the aircrew manual that uh, there may be excessive forces yeah. on the rudder. Yeah. So you may have to physically constrain the rudder pedals to the neutral position. Mm. And then I'm afraid we'll have to see what happens from then on in. I'll get you to help me with that. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> because spinning is very disorientating, to reduce the risks, the school aircraft, which operate way outside normal RAF limits, are fitted with a radio link which transmits data to a backseat pilot at Boscombe Down. All the readouts from the aircraft spinning 25,000 feet above are duplicated for the pilot on the ground. If his airborne colleague gets into trouble, the safety pilot can advise on recovery action. Steve Moore and tutor Vic Lockwood walk to the Hawk. The weather is good. It has to be. For even at the test pilot school, spinning is only permitted with the ground in sight. Unlike the Jet Provost, the Hawk, though dual-controlled, does not have side-by-side -side seats. The student sits in the front seat. <laughs> Spinning imposes severe stresses on the airframe, and any loose panels could jam the control surfaces and prevent recovery. So the visual checks are especially thorough. Flaps are checked, and so are the ailerons. Later, they're going to cause Steve trouble. The Hawk, like most of the school's aircraft, is fitted with additional instruments which show the actual position of the control surfaces. Both student and tutor can see exactly what the pilot has done. The intake guards removed and the engine started.
the radio link to the Boscombe Down safety pilot is tested. Twenty-five thousand feet below, the telemetry antenna tracks the hawk, and the ground pilot confirms the details of the first spin. Neutral and normal recovery. In New Zealand, Steve Moore flew Strike Masters, an armed version of the Jet Provost. This is his first spin in the Hawk. Full left rudder, I have had through on all of those. Full right rudder is now on. It is far from smooth, but that is normal for a Hawk, and Steve recovers without difficulty. Oh well, that's good work, try. Pleasure has recovered. Send number four will be erect to the left from a level entry, four turns, applying in spin, not at a hesitation, for a normal recovery. Back to 25,000 feet for spin number two. This time, it goes wrong. Very wrong indeed. Inadvertently, Steve is applying a little outspin aileron, turning the hawk away from the direction of the spin. It nearly goes into the forbidden and dangerous inverted spin. Vic Lockwood sees the fault, takes over, and recovers the aircraft. On the ground, the pen's traces record the details of Steve's error for the post-mortem after the flight. Steve makes several other spins without further incident and quickly regains his confidence. In a spin, a jet aircraft's engine can flame out and be impossible to relight. To train for that, should it happen his solo spin, on the return to Boscombe Down, Steve makes a practice dead engine landing. With the engine at idle, the approach has to be steep in order to keep up safe flying speed. With a dead engine, there is only one chance. Judgment has to be perfect. Next, the debrief. I always say always be prepared for the unexpected. And during what was a fairly straightforward entry to a spin, in fact, the hawk almost went inverted once, and uh, the reason for that was that the student had uh, not followed directly the instructions I had given and had sneaked in some outspin aileron at the wrong moment. And uh, it's then that you have to think quickly and, and recover. Then we go back and try it again. I think he learned more in that sortie than he will ever admit. Um, I think he felt a little chastened uh, after a while when his entry techniques were not consistent. But by the end of the sortie, he'd regained his confidence because he'd overcome that problem. Well, when I entered the spin, I had a, uh, a small amount of aileron input. The stick in the, in the uh, hawk, the way it slightly handed over to the left. So um, what I was doing, two hands on it, which is a bit of a habit forming thing with me because of the strike mass has got fairly high um, elevator forces. So to relieve the load on the arms a bit, I used to pull back with both hands. And I think I was doing that with this. And uh, as a result, that canted bit of the stick holding the top, I was bringing it into the middle. That could have been it. That's my excuse anyway. <laughs> the final exercise is spinning the hunter. It is unique to the school. For an RAF service, spinning a hunter is not permitted. We are, in fact, the only course that spin swept wing aircraft. We are lucky to have an aircraft which we can spin both erect and inverted in. Uh, perhaps I can explain to you what I mean by erect and inverted. This is a, a model of the Hunter. I, in an erect spin, what is happening, the aircraft is traveling down a vertical path, and in doing so, it is rolling, and it is pitching, and it is yawing, and therefore it is taking this sort of motion. And that's an erect spin, because you can see quite clearly the pilot is still sitting upright in the cockpit and is experiencing these motions. And so the forces are in the normal sense, from head 
to turn. If we look at inverted spinning, the airplane is in fact spinning upside down. So it's still pitching, it is still rolling, and it is still yawing, but the pilot inside is upside down and the forces are being felt from toe to head, so the blood is moving towards the brain. If, it's very difficult to follow, but the aircraft is rolling and it's yawing. If you see now, I'm rolling towards the left, but if you act, watch, I'm yawing to the right. So the roll and the yaw are in opposite directions, and that can be very, very confusing. Confusing enough for the RAF to have lost 29 aircraft in spinning accidents in recent years. The student about to spin the Hunter is Dave Southwood. His brief is to suppose that the aircraft is new, about to service as an operational trainer, and must therefore be cleared for students accidentally getting into spins. The school hunter has special instruments which can help a pilot to recover from a spin should he become disorientated. You can get disorientated in the spin. Certainly it's, uh, it's an exercise or flight training where you do need a fair amount of practice to, to stay familiar with it. But again, it's one of the things we're looking at the airplane for to see how disorientating it is. Because if it's too disorientating and confusing, then uh, there's no way you can let solo students go off and spin it. As the hunter climbs, Dave switches on his cockpit voice recorder, which will help him analyze the exercise later. Thank you for oscillations and uh, any engine problems. Any comments on the rudder forces as it goes oscillatory. Full us all on and entry. Hesitation after a quarter of a turn. Nose to 30 nose down. Some hesitation just after one turn. Waiting for the next hesitation. Going there. And going, going out, spin over on. Missed the second turn, fly then, that's three. Going more stable with nose about 40 nose down. There's your solution. Uh, feeding in the air. Come very steep nose down. Nose pitching to about 20 below the horizon. With a trumping off the stops. Wing tilt angle increasing about 40 degrees. Between the oscillations. Going very essentially pitching from about 45 nose down. Engine now 6.3, JPT still 400. On the ground, Vic Lockwood, acting as safety pilot, has noticed a problem. Engine is beginning to overtap. Check engine, check your engine. And recovering, centralized nade on. Dave Southwood does and acknowledges. He's recovered. I'm recovered. Well, the RPM's coming back about 6450. Filing JPT's coming back to 400. Tights will be good. The aging hunters at Boscombe Down remain the only swept wing aircraft in the world that are routinely spun inverted. As always, Dave will have to write a lengthy report. Spin one. Direct spin to the right from a level entry. One turn, neutralizing. His recorded notes are a help, but the workload on the test pilot's course is very high. Yes, it is a high workload. We do expect the students to spend a lot of, large proportion of their own time actually working at producing reports, and uh, it's very much self pressure. Um, it's up to the individual really how much time he puts in. Everyone's going to have to put in a, a lot of time, but some do put in a lot more than others, yes. 90% of the course, I would say is involved in writing up these reports here. So as you can appreciate, after every flight, we've got to sit down, analyze all the data that we've taken, and then try and put it together in, in English so that somebody else who's not necessarily connected with aviation, a uh, scientist or whatever, can actually understand what we found in the air. It, it was one of those things that everybody said when we started the course that it would be a very hard working year and that you'd sit there working till one, two o'clock in the morning. And I didn't really think it would be possible to work till those sort of hours and get up and do a normal working day the next day. But uh, I think from that point of view, I've learned a lot about myself um, from the work side during the year. The fact that you can work sometimes till, wait till three, four o'clock or even all through the night, that you can work to that extent um, and, and basically carry on.
So you do find out how much you really can do? I was going through the course, yes. I, it was the morning of my 30th birthday. I got up to take a shave, and uh, for the first time in the morning, I, I looked in the mirror. And there, to my horror, was this old man looking back. I'd aged about 10 years on the course. The sight and sound of the past. A Pratt & Whitney air-cooled radial engine. It is powering a de Havilland Beaver, borrowed from the Army Air Corps, for an exercise in stability which, though not as risky as spinning, does involve stalling the big army monoplane. James Giles and his American student Tom Coulter take off to investigate the handling of this high-wing monoplane of dated design. You'll never make a silk purse out of a thing too like this airplane. You wouldn't want to. It would take away all its character. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's one thing to be said about these type of airplanes. The harder they are to fly sometimes, the people get more personality with them. They like them better. So if you'd like to go into a progressive steady heading size ship now, so that you go all the way through to full rudder. We know we can, so. OK, well, we come on with the right rudder. OK, right rudder. OK, so we're immediately seeing that right rudder is generating right size lift. Right size lift. And a lot of left aileron required. Back. Almost full left aileron. We're sitting on our sides now, 35 degrees angle of bank. And kick off the drift quickly, and we'll see how much size of bank we got from heading 110 to 085, about 25, 25 degrees of size of bank. And now the stall and exercise. Let's come back into a stall from there. Speed's dropping down now uh, to, well, you talk us through it. Okay, we're down to 55 uh, knots now, speed's dropping back down. Ailerons are very light, and we're starting to use a little rudder for directional control. To fight. There's 40, 40 knots. knots. Easing the nose up, a little buffet on the elevator. Keep it coming back. Line. Keep it coming back, 35 knots. And it breaks and off to the right. Breaks off down to the right. Lower the nose. My power to recover. Bring the nose back up to about 65 knots and climb away. Okay. Right, so we can see that we're carefully going to stall it again. Yeah, working on it. As one stalling exercise ends, another begins with the Andover taking off from Boston Down. The heavy transport is being flown by the helicopter student from Singapore, JT, with tutor Colin Wilcock. Uh, we'll indication. Try the controls now. I mean, if the guy is not trying it, you are not getting sloppy. Yes. The aircraft staying level That's because right. there wasn't any weak drop. So there's yes. no need for a pilot to. Okay. The students on both the fixed and rotary wing courses have to be able to fly each other's aircraft. This side, this side. Oh, just. Mirko Zuliani, the Italian fighter pilot, is to fly this Lynx. The instructor, Mike Butt, does the takeoff. The exercise is to show Mirko how to make an auto-rotational descent, that is, without engine power. Right, Mirko, do watch the torque variation, and do watch the amount of pedal you have to put in when you bring in the uh, lever at the bottom of the auto-rotation. Okay. okay, so I'll hand over control to you, and then we'll go straight into one to the right. Okay, you have control. I have a control. That's good control. Uh, Meanwhile, JT, the helicopter pilot, is being instructed in the art of stalling the Andover. Have a look at what happens when you get closer to the stall, finally going into the stall itself, and then recovering from it. Right, as you get down towards it, you're still out of it now. Just have a look at how effective the controls are. That's right. Okay, and the rudder. Okay, now let the, the engine, the airplane, decelerate till you get the buffet. Let it keep coming down now, and we'll just go straight to a stall. Okay, okay. airframe buffer. Right, now recover. Cover, stick forward. Okay, roll it level. Pick up the wing, as I get out of the stall. JT eases the transport out of the dive. 
as Mirko, jet fighter pilot, makes his first helicopter landing. A little bit of left pedal as you come down. That's it. There we are. Super. That was very good. the uh, sortie back out? Interesting, but strange, you know. It's uh, the first time that uh, I flew with uh, this uh, helicopter. At the end of the summer term, there is the staff wash-up, a confidential meeting to discuss the students' progress, or otherwise. We asked tutor James Giles for his opinion of the course so far. Well, uh, it's like all courses. There are one or two who are very good, and... Uh, very good indeed, in fact. They're showing a lot of imagination in the air. They're planning well, flying well, and really on top of it. Uh, at the other end of the scale, there are one or two who are having problems um, with adapting to flying as a test pilot. They can fly perfectly well, as they're perfectly safe, but they're having to work very hard at uh, actually being a test pilot. And I think that if you were to see the chaps at the beginning of the course and now, you will see that uh, they are visibly tired and aged because the pressure that's upon them. And so the biggest problem, from the staff point of view, is knowing just how far to push these chaps. As it always has, the summer term ends with the traditional cricket match, the staff versus the students. The staff are batting. Lockwood, caught and bowled, Ludford. You catch the rules so far? Yeah. Serge Aubert bowls from his short run. Right, yours, Les. The boss gets a single. The score is irrelevant. The staff have never lost the fixture since it began in 1943, partly because the overseas students are never given the rules. No, oh, what's happening now? Some change? How is it? There's always a lot of change, but you never notice who changes with what. <laughs> In fitful sunshine and increasing rain, the students bat. They have to be careful, it being understood that any student getting into double figures is placing his future in jeopardy. Not that any do. <laughs> Dave Southwood takes off on the wrong runway and is out. Great. <laughs> Harry Fail, last man in, is prepared to save the match. Alas, the Germans have never really understood cricket. Oh, <laughs> 